Bob Marley and the CIA. Hi, I'm David Dusty Couples, author of Stir It Up, The CIA Targets Jamaica, Bob Marley and the Progressive Manly Government, a novel of history, music, roots and culture, and a little psychology from my educational background. A feast for any true reggae fan, says reggae historian Roger Steffens, reggae superstar Luciano with his copy of Stir It Up, me with root superstar Bushman, and here in 2017, giving the annual Bob Marley lecture at the Global Reggae Conference at University of West Indies in Kingston. Watch this space for that video soon to come. The present video is adapted from Get Up, Stand Up, Bob Marley and the CIA, a podcast by Richard Surrett, featuring interviews with me, yours truly, David Couples, Roger Steffens, and Casey Gain McCullough, all of us authors who've written and spoken about the life and turbulent times of Bob Marley. All right then, enough said, let's get with the program. Take it away, Richard! In order to understand Bob Marley and his music, it's important to understand the political forces in Jamaica that profoundly shaped Marley's music. In 1972, the PNP swept to power led by Michael Manley, the son of a noted sculptor, Edna Swithenbank, and Norman Manley, the co-founder of the PNP and Jamaica's premier from 1959 to independence in 1962. Once in office, Manley set about instituting policies for redistributing wealth. Roger Steffens is a noted reggae historian and the author of So Much Things to Say, an oral history of Bob Marley. Michael Manley was no doubt a lover of left-wing government and made friends with Castro, went to Cuba, pictures taken of him shaking hands and smiling together. On one of those trips, Bob Marley was rumored to have accompanied Manley. Certainly a big bone of contention for the United States was his support of Cuba's intervention in Angola, especially leading up to the elections in 1976. They were fighting the South African mercenary-backed right-wing forces of the dictators, and there was a kind of a socialist progressive force who Fidel Castro actually sent arms and troops. A man I knew who was in the government under Manley told me that one day the door to Manley's office swung open and in strode Henry Kissinger himself, telling him to stop doing this and to get away from Castro and anything to do with Cuba or else the United States was going to take action against him. Michael Manley refused, and a lot of people point to that moment as the, the trigger for when Kissinger and George W. Bush, who was the head of the CIA at the time, decided to launch a massive destabilization program against Jamaica. CIA did not want Michael Manley to be in power in Jamaica, and whatever they could do to destabilize that was seen as, as positive by the, the American government. Meanwhile, the opposition Jamaican Labour Party, or JLP, was led by Edward Philip George Siaga, who was born in Boston and educated at Harvard. As a record producer and record company owner, Siaga also played a major role in the development of the Jamaican music industry. He was also viewed more favorably by the U.S. State Department, who saw in Siaga a free market-minded ally. Casey Gain McCalla is a journalist, rapper, and the author of Inside the CIA's Secret War in Jamaica. I think Edward Siago is actually the first person to visit Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan was elected in office. He was uh, educated at Harvard, very pro-capitalism, very pro-U.S. He would uh, meet with former heads of the CIA in the United States. He was definitely very fiercely anti-communist, which was very um, pleasing to the Americans, especially in the CIA. If the CIA did plot to destabilize Jamaica, it would have been a mission best described as piling on. 
Jamaica was already destabilized thanks to a two-party system built upon corruption. David Couples is the author of Stir It Up, The CIA Targets Jamaica, Bob Marley, and the Progressive Manly Movement. For one thing, there was a lot of cronyism. I mean, this is a very poor country coming into uh, independence, and uh, there wasn't a lot of money to go around. So when your guy was in office, your guys got favored. You know, they got the money. And Manley really kind of wanted to end that, and I'm not too sure how well he did. David here, cutting in a moment. This question caught me a bit off guard. I do not believe that politics in Jamaica was built on corruption. I believe it was built by heroic, dedicated, hardworking people who fought for independence much in the manner of the civil rights struggle in the United States. Jamaica afterwards falling victim to the ravages of neoliberal economics. In the big picture, the cronyism is small potatoes. And it certainly makes no sense to say the country was destabilized before the CIA got involved. All right, enough said. Back to our interviews. Politics in Jamaica is basically divided between two gangs, thugs, criminals, that control the various neighborhoods, uh, mainly drug-dealing dons, and uh, the government often becomes hostage to, to those forces. So in the 60s, when the JLP started arming itself, the PNP felt it had to defend itself, and they started uh, importing guns too, and and that led to one violent election after another. Well, we had tough gangs on both sides, and probably probably the gangs on the JLP side. We believe many of us that they were being supplied with guns, so they really outgunned the PNP. And you know, there's not necessarily uh, all of them were really sweethearted peace-loving guys on both sides. But it was a political war, it was a tribal war, and also the idea that the CIA was bringing in cocaine, and they would use that to kind of induce the gangsters to do what they want. The Shower Posse was the most notorious of the JLP gangs. By the way, that name has nothing to do with the idea that they will shower people with bullets. <laughs> uh, it comes from a speech that uh, Siaga made that if people voted for him, riches would fall from the sky like rain. They would sh riches would shower down. But after about 1980, even Siaga got fed up with him, and he started coming after them. And they had to escape to uh, Toronto and, and New York, where they became uh, really the toughest gangs in the in the whole country. It seems that the CIA uh, and the Shower Posse were uh, aligned because. They were, the CIA was definitely supporting the Jamaican Labor Party, and the Jamaican Labor Party uh, had uh, among its followers members of the shower posse. While international fame still eluded Marley, by the 1970s, he was a musical and cultural icon in Jamaica, and his music conveyed the truths of his troubled homeland. And while he tried to rise above politics, Marley was quickly becoming a political icon. Roger Stephens. A lot of Marley's music reflected the political turmoil going on. Three o'clock roadblock comes to mind immediately. The, the curfew laws and uh, being pulled over at random and searched for ganja. The top ranking, Are You Skanking? The survival album. So much of Bob's music is based on the facts of his life. Uh, no woman, no cry, giving solace to the, the women who lost their children in the ghetto violence. Bob was singing about the downpression of his people and uh, trying to find a way to give solace to those who were suffering. Bob certainly was a spiritual leader, but when you look at his lyrics... He's not just advocating that people, you know, love Jaw Rastafari and develop this spiritual side of them. He's also writing about all the things in culture that are keeping the people down. You know, uh, them belly full, but we hungry. A hungry mob is an angry mob. And uh, Get Up, Stand Up, one of his most famous songs, Stand Up For Your Rights. Rise ye mighty people, there's work to be done, so let's do it little by little from Wake Up and Live. Well, there's one song that which he released in 1976 called Rat Race, where Bob Marley explicitly called out the CIA and denounced them when he said, don't involve Rasta with your sasse, which is like, you're your silly business. And he follows that up by Rasta no work for no CIA, which was at a time 
one could interpret as people trying from the Jamaica Labor Party to get Bob to be involved with their business. And he's saying, I do not want to be involved with your business because your business is that of the CIA. And this, this is where we get into Bob as more of the radical revolutionary. So arm in arm with arms, we fight this little struggle. Was Bob a political man? He didn't want to be political, but he just wasn't writing songs of spirituality. He was writing about what was going on politically, economically. They sat around a 56 Hope Road, you know, and had their breakfast and read the paper every day, and they studied what was going on. They weren't off just meditating and preaching. And he talks about see them bribing with their guns, spare parts, and money trying to belittle our integrity. So what he's saying is watch how these politicians are trying to bribe people in the ghettos with guns and money to be loyal to their political party to try and, you know, take out their character. And then he says through political strategy, they keep us fighting. And when you got to get some food, your brother has to be your enemy. So basically he's saying he's not even just attacking the, the JLP. He's attacking the whole system of political violence in Jamaica, where in order for poor people to even eat or survive, they need to fight against their own brothers and their sisters in the opposite political party, whether it be the PNP or the JLP. Bunny was the spiritual side. Bob was Martin Luther King and Peter was Malcolm X with a band. But Bob and Peter were equally militant. There's no question about that. In December 1975, Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley refused U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's demands to stop supporting Cuba and the rebels in Angola. Within a few months, Operation Werewolf, directed by the CIA with the help of the opposition JLP, began. Casey Gain McCalla. Operation Werewolf was a cool plot to take over Michael Manley, and there were a couple people, one gentleman by the name of Pernell Charles, who was detained, and there was a, another gentleman who were kind of detained, and they were said to have documents of a big plot to, you know, armed resurrection, and um, some of these, so this is what led to a state of emergency in Jamaica, where Michael Manley would detain a number of high-ranking members of the Jamaica Labor Party, including Pernell Charles. Leading up to the 1970s, election, violence between rival gangs in Kingston, loyal to the JLP and the PNP, increased dramatically. Meanwhile, gang members and political figures from both sides were frequent visitors to 56 Hope Row, Bob Marley's residence in Kingston. Once again, David Couples. You know, they're coming in from both sides. And, you know, you can imagine that they're being very careful that he doesn't go over to the other side. Maybe not so much that, you know, he's not, they're not expecting him to necessarily wield political power for them, but they're watching very closely that he doesn't start becoming an advocate of the other side. And, and, uh, I think that, uh, Bob knew, uh, leading up to the elections of 1976, that it was a very dangerous time, uh, but the gangsters coming in were tough guys, you know. But, you know, they all loved him, and Bob was sitting and talk with him. Although I understand that Michael Manley and, and his wife Beverly would, would often drop by. You know, they're basically neighbors just down the block. And they would drop by and uh, visit with Bob, and I'm sure they had long conversations. You know, my uh, Timothy White says they would spend whole evenings down at uh, 56 Hope Road with Bob. I don't think there's any doubt that... Bob was much more in tune with Michael Manley than he was Edward Siaga, who is basically touting, you know, the American way uh, of life, you know, the American economic system. Bob became essentially a, a peacemaker. His headquarters near the prime minister's residence on Hope Road in, in uptown Kingston was the site of... <laughs> More or less a rapprochement, uh, neutral turf for people from both sides to come and uh, not end up killing each other. Uh, it, it was a fruitless attempt on his part because it was some friends of, uh, putative friends of his who came to kill him. It wasn't just politicians and gang members who came to Hope Road. The downtrodden and dispossessed also flocked to Marley's house, where they knew they would receive a warm welcome. 
Bob's humanitarianism was it was legendary in Jamaica. The people would come to his yard and line up around the block, and Bob would take care of them. He'd, he'd help them with food and things for school and, and a little bit of cash here and there. And it was, I mean, some people said that he was taking care of thousands of people, which is just uh, incredible. I mean, he wasn't that rich. I mean, he was starting to sell sell some records after about 1974, 75, not tons of records, but, you know, he was not a super wealthy man. His business manager, Colin Leslie, is a dear friend of mine, and he had to sign the check. So uh, I don't think there's anybody in the world who knew uh, as much uh, about where Bob's money went than he, and perhaps uh, Don Taylor, the manager. But uh, Colin Leslie said that Bob was responsible each month for the support of perhaps as many as 6,000 people. Uh, one day, um, a man came in this long line that was ever present when Bob was home um, and, and wanted to uh, start a, a, a coconut oil business. And uh, Bob wrote him a big check on the spot. And when the guy left, Colin said, Bob, why did you do that? And Bob said, I've always wanted to be in the oil business. His biggest hit, No Woman, No Cry, he actually gave to a friend of his and gave him so he could keep the money and the rights. A friend of his name, Vincent Ford, who would actually do the cooking for him when he was in the government yard of Trenchtown. He was feeding, I've heard of upwards of 5,000 families in Jamaica alone. He would just hand out money. He wasn't a particularly materialistic person. He did have a BMW, but the reason he had a BMW is because it stood for Bob Marley and the Whalers. But he was generous to a fault. He gave away almost all his money. He probably bought three dozen houses for his baby mothers and his band members and his family and friends and never had a house of his own to the day he passed. Uh, he didn't even have a real bed. He slept on a cot in the attic. And uh, it wasn't until about 18 months before he passed that some of the women in his life bought him a form of a real bed. He loved sleeping on the ground with that rock stone for his pillow that he sang about in his songs. Bob Marley may have thought of himself as above politics, yet he had considerable political power, whether he liked it or not. By 1976, he was becoming an international superstar, which only intensified his power and influence at home. 1976, the Whalers are starting to acquire worldwide visibility. Rolling Stone has just named them the band of the year. And Time Magazine has said that Bob Marley is a force to rival the government. So you're seeing how big Bob is starting to become. You might have like a Pete Seeger in America or a Bob Dylan who represent a voice against the government. A lot of the things about Bob Marley is that it was just a voice for uh, a greater people. So if the people want to take over the government, Bob Marley is a spokesperson. They can rally around him. But him himself, I don't think he saw himself as a political entity that would, you know, take over and run a government. But it's very possible he could have become prime minister in Jamaica very easily. I think the statement that Time magazine made about Bob Marley in 76, having so much power that he could topple a government was quite accurate. Once he became a star overseas, he became a star in Jamaica. And the Topper Norrises, as he called them, the people who lived up in Beverly Hills above Kingston, the people who really ran the, the country through their uh, subordinates, through the gangs. There was this situation where Marley really was frightening to those people and, and they wanted him out of the way. After Stevie Wonder performed a benefit concert for blind children in Jamaica in 1975, Marley decided it was time he did a free concert. Since the original Whalers split in 1974, Marley was anxious to perform live again. But before he could make any arrangements, Prime Minister Manley beat him to the punch. Roger Stephens. Posters started to appear around Kingston saying that Marley was going to do a free show on the lawn of a prime minister. And for any singer, musician to be publicly identified with a political party could be, in some cases, suicidal. So Marley went down the block and confronted Manley. And it was finally agreed between them that he could do a, a show in National Heroes Park Circle, an outdoor venue. Um, and it would have no political overtones whatsoever. And right after they announced the concert, 
to be held on Sunday, December 5th, 1976, Prime Minister Manley announced that national elections would be held a few days after. So by appearing on that stage with Bob at that concert, which he was sure to do, it would make, it would make Marley appear to be endorsing the re-election of Michael Manley. So he immediately came under death threats from the JLP. He thought he was above it all because he thought, you know, he was our artist. No one would shoot him. Then he had friends in the PNP and he had friends in the JLP. Rita and Judy and Marcia all were scared to death. And Marcia hopped on a plane and flew to Miami. Both Rita and Judy had, talking about the I-3, right? The three female singers that backed Bob. Rita and Judy both had premonitions, bloody premonitions. Bob himself had a dream in which he saw gunmen coming to uh, shoot his mother. They take dreams very seriously in that African Jamaican culture down there. And I, I'm pretty sure that Bob would have been really, really thinking that he was in the hot seat. And he was guarded uh, day and night by something called the Echo Squad, which was composed of gangsters from both political parties. And yet, the night of the shooting, Friday, December 3rd, those guards that had been with him for weeks, constantly, day and night, suddenly disappeared from his compound, allowing those two carloads of gunmen to, uh, to break through. Okay, that's a wrap uh, for part one. Thanks for watching. I'll get part two up soon as we get further into the Smile Jamaica concert, the assassination attempt at Bob's home in Kingston, and, of course, Bob's legacy. Roger, Casey, and I hope you'll check out our books on Amazon and the major online vendors. Roger's is also in bookstores. Email us for signed copies and to say hello. Email roger at rossraja at aol.com. For Casey, caseygain at gmail.com. And yours truly, David, I'm at davidcdusty at hotmail.com. U.S. residents, please take half a minute to sign my petition to cancel Jamaica's foreign debt, a huge burden for over 40 years that prevents development and keeps the people down. Some, like myself, call it neocolonial exploitation. Use this Google search term and pass it on to your colleagues and contacts. If we all pull together, we just might pull off a miracle. If you miss anything and for more links, check the description section with this video. Click on my photo icon for more videos about Jamaica and the Stir It Up preview trailer with great reggae music you may never have heard before. Until next time, as Bob says, Put your vision to reality, yeah.